Hey, I'm Phil. Thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. So one easy way that you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321 or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us and we hope you enjoyed today's message. So we're jumping in to a new series. I'm excited about this series. You may have seen those words on the screen, forgiveness, and you may not be quite as excited as I am, right? Because that idea of forgiveness is a difficult topic. Why? Because when we talk about forgiveness, we have to talk about things that we need to forgive. And when you start to talk about those types of things, you start to have to work through difficult situations in your life. You start to have to dig up things in your past. You start to have to think about people that you have been really trying hard not to think about. And so there's this, this weight, right, that comes with this this topic of forgiveness, because forgif- forgiveness is often complex, it's all often messy, and usually it comes with baggage, right? Talking about why, why should I forgive? Why should I move forward? How do I get past the hurt that I'm feeling from this person or from that situation or from this group that did this to me? But the reality is, Scripture addresses forgiveness time and time and time and time again. And it reminds us that we have to be people who live at peace. And part of people who are living at peace means seeking forgiveness and working through the difficult realities of relationships. And so tonight, we're going to jump into this series where we begin to talk about forgiveness. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about forgiveness, different facets of it, how to do it, attitudes, what we need to do as believers when talking and dealing with things that we need to forgive. And so to jump off tonight, we're going to talk about what Jesus has to say about forgiveness. So open with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. If you got your Bibles, open up with me. If you got your phone, download the River Church app or another Bible app, open up to the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you, run back to guest services. They have Bibles available. We want to make sure that you have God's Word. But open with me in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. So here Jesus, he says, all right, I'm going to teach you how to pray. And so he starts by saying, pray like this. And then he begins to pray, which in scripture is affectionately called the Lord's Prayer. You may have heard it. Maybe you've heard your grandma pray it before as we read through it. And you may be thinking to yourself, Justin, I thought we were talking about forgiveness. Why why are we looking at a passage where Jesus is talking about how to pray? Well, here's the deal. If Jesus is going to teach on prayer, right, he only has a finite amount of time on earth during his ministry before he went to the cross, he's going to very much prioritize what he wants to get across in that specific amount of time. And so as he teaches them to pray, and what he teaches them to pray about should reflect some priorities in our lives and in our prayer lives. And so when Jesus teaches them how to pray, he's not talking about how to pray for their sick dog. He's not talking to them about how to pray for getting what they want in a new car, right? He is choosing some priorities that they need to make sure they are focused on in their spiritual lives, so much so that they're bringing them before God in prayer. And so we see as we get a picture into Jesus' teaching about prayer, we see through his teaching on prayer priorities 
for our lives as believers. So we, it's kind of a double whammy, right? We see what we should be praying about and therefore what we should be concerned about in our lives as we live them. And so with that, let's pick up Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so right there, it's talking about our mindset, right? Our mindset should be focused on God, should be focused on our Father, and as we live on earth, our lives should be centered around living in a way as if to build his kingdom here on earth, right? And so right there, we see mindset, we see focus. And as we're focused like that, then there should be some things that we're concerned about in our own lives. And so he continues, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? So here, there are three requests that he lays before God. He says, these are some things, they, these are some things that should concern you. Right? Your physical well-being, your physical needs, your spiritual needs in twofold. First, in forgiveness from God. Then, in our compassion and our forgiveness of others. And then, our ability to resist sin according to the Lord's strength. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But then, Jesus kind of begins to transfer or shift phases here from talking about prayer to highlighting a piece of his prayer. Verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so here, as Jesus talks through what it means to pray and highlights some physical and spiritual needs that we as believers should be concerned about, he begins to highlight one specifically. You see how he's like honing more and more in? The reason for that, it, it, there's a bunch of different reasons really, but for our purposes tonight, the reason for that is he begins to focus on what would be difficult for them to understand. They understand that they have spiritual needs. Uh, specifically, a spiritual need for forgiveness, a spiritual need to, re to resist sin. They also understand that they have physical needs, right? If your stomach's ever rumbled, you know you have some sort of physical need. They understood that. But I think the thing that was a little bit foreign to them was this idea of forgiving others. That wasn't necessarily high on their priority list. Why? Because it is really, really hard, right? It's really, really difficult. And so he's emphasizing the need to make this a priority because oftentimes we love to prioritize our physical needs. We love to prioritize resisting sin and temptation, but we hate Dealing with forgiveness. Because it's so difficult. Because it means sacrificing your wants and your desires to make things right. Both in seeking forgiveness, but also in forgiving those that have wronged you. And there's acknowledgement here. He says, you constantly want to be forgiven by your heavenly father, but the reality is when you don't forgive others, you make yourselves look foolish. Why? Because you are acting so incredibly hypocritical. How can you ask for forgiveness from your debts and yet hold on to these debts of anger and frustration and rage and hurt against others? 
He's saying it's so backwards. Forgiveness goes hand in hand, receiving and giving. So there's this call here. There's this specific emphasis in his prayer on a need to forgive others. As we seek forgiveness from God, we must seek to forgive others. And so tonight, I want to look at Kind of two major pieces of forgiveness. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be t- taking a look at all these different facets of forgiveness. But tonight, I want to take a look at two major ones. So the first one is why we forgive. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. So here, we see, right, in, in Jesus' prayer, he says, Forgive us our debts. As we have also forgiven our debtors. And so right here, he's laying this foundation of like finances. Like a financial debt. We've placed ourselves in debt. And so we have debts that need to be forgiven, that need to be paid out. And the problem is, we don't have the money to pay them out. See, this is not about finances, it's about a spiritual need of debt, or a spiritual debt that needs to be paid, and we are woefully bankrupt. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, 7 to 10, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's talking about the fulfillment of this debt. He's trying to help the the church here to see where, or how, specifically, Their account has been dealt with or paid out. It says this. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption. In Christ Jesus, he's talking about. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, things in heaven and things on earth. And so right here you see, right, there's this separation between us and God because of our debt, We couldn't pay the toll or the tax or whatever financial word you want to use. We had something that kept us separated from God, and that was our sin. Scripture says the wages of sin or the very minimum thing that we can earn with our sin, you know, we talk about minimum wage, the very minimum thing that we earn with our, our sin is death, spiritual separation from God. Not to mention, we earn consequences. We earn hurt. Right? Those are the things where, you know, talk about moving up the pay scale of sin. But he says the very minimum thing, the least you can be paid, the least you can earn with your sin is death. And so that has to be paid, right? That separation from God has to be paid out and dealt to you. And so there's this separation, this separation that exists. And Paul says here, in him, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of those trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. You see, there's only one person ever to exist that did not earn that minimum wage. Christ Jesus. He lived on earth, and lived a sinless life. Not only that, he was tempted directly by Satan in the wilderness, and he resisted. He lived up. He he did not sin. He did not earn a wage of death. Yet, he went to the cross and shed his blood on the cross. He was beaten, bruised, whipped, and murdered. So that your sin and my sin debt could be paid. So that the wages that we earned could be dealt 
to him instead. And it says, this grace, this grace which was rich, he had such riches and magnificent payout of grace and forgiveness that he lavished it on us. He didn't pay one sin, he didn't pay two sins, he paid all sins. Should we accept that lavishness and rich gift that he gives us freely? Then he rose from the grave showing that he paid out and still had money left in the bank. And so we see that this forgiveness, this sin debt that we who are debtors have been forgiven our debt according to Christ Jesus. Paul says that in Romans that all we have to do to receive that salvation or that gift of his grace, the riches of his grace, is confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that he is risen from the dead. That is the only way our sin debt can be paid. And you may be asking yourself, why? Why would God do this? I mean, you see yourself, you know, I know there are plenty of people who are uh, struggling in debt. I'm not going down to pay their debts. I got my own, right? So why would, why would Christ Jesus do that for me? Why would God send his son to pay that debt for me? Well, the first and foremost reason is because he loves you. He loves you and he cares for you and he sees your hurt and he sees that death that you are living in and he desires that you not live there anymore. And we see that picture really in verse 10, the end of verse 9, he says, which he set forth in Christ, according to, so he says, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so what he's saying is he wants unity, unity among believers, unity among brothers and sisters in Christ, unity among people, unity between each one of them and himself. And so he has sought that unity through his blood, his death and resurrection in each of us. Then he calls us to seek that unity among one another, right? So there's the call. Once again, in this beautiful picture of the forgiveness that we've been given, a call, a push to forgiveness, to unity amongst us as believers and us amongst other people in humanity. And we see it even pushed elsewhere in Scripture in the Old Testament, Proverbs 17, 9, a book that is filled with wisdom upon wisdom, wisdom recognized by even those who are not believers as incredibly wise. We see the, the wisdom of the Proverbs says this, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Right here, those who seek forgiveness seek to deal with things that are going wrong, things that are hurting, things that have made offenses seek love and unity and forgiveness, but those who want to constantly go back and back and back and refuse to acknowledge and refuse to deal with and always want to hold against, you are seeking the opposite of what God is seeking. You are seeking separation, whereas he desires unity. He desired it so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for it. And so we see what Jesus is teaching and what he's praying for and what Paul is teaching and what Solomon is writing in the Proverbs is all saying this. How can you claim forgiveness and not offer forgiveness? 
There's got to be a disconnect. If we want to claim the forgiveness that God has given us and saying, God, we're all in, we want to follow you, but yet we keep withholding forgiveness from that person or this person or for that offense or this offense, there's a disconnect. Maybe for you it's pride. Yes, I sinned and I needed forgiveness, but I didn't sin like them. Yeah, I've done some things wrong. I get it, Justin. Yep, yeah, you're right. When you talk about this whole sin thing and the things that it's earned in me, you hit the nail on the head. But I tell you what, I may have earned some death, but they earned some death, you know? And when I say it like that, you, you laugh because you see the foolishness in that. But that's what we tell ourselves all the time. Guys, here's the reality. Death is death. Separation from God is separation from God. We love to classify our sins in categories. Oh, this one's way worse than this one. You know what? Both are sending you straight to hell. That's the reality. And so there's verses like Ephesians 1, 7 through 10 in, in Scripture, and they're designed to show and illustrate the depth of our sin and the incredible need we have for a Savior. The reality is, if we refuse to forgive others, what we are saying, or what you may be saying, is, yes, I acknowledge I got some sin. You know what I hear in that? I don't understand the depth of my sin and need for a Savior. I don't understand the length to which Christ went to save me from my sin. Or, so it's either that pride has creeped into our hearts and said, you know, we're better than them, or it's a refusal to follow and give your life, your full life to Christ. Yes, I understand, uh, you know, I understand I was this deep, deep sinner, and I understand that I need that salvation from God, and, I, and I'm all good with following him and stuff that makes sense. I just can't do that. That shows some spiritual compartmentalization. God, I'll give you the portions of my life that I want you to make better, but I'm going to keep close to the chest some other things. And you wonder why you're struggling in your addiction. Maybe that's something you've been holding close to the chest too. I got two things I won't give God. You know, I, got, I won't talk about my addiction or tell people about my addiction, so I'm going to keep that real close to the chest. Or, you know, I'll ask for help sometimes, but I won't, won't reach out in the middle of it because I don't want to seem like a weak person. And I definitely won't talk about the pain that I've got just deep down, just wrenching inside of me. Some things that have happened to me or some ways that people have treated me or done things to me. I, 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 I just, I won't do that. I won't talk about that. God has given you a free gift of forgiveness. And he looks to lead you in all facets of your life. And he looks to bring all things in your life to reconciliation. To make all things in your life right. If you won't give him those things and let him make them right, you can't be surprised when they're still festering and they're still hurting, and they're still poisonous, and they're still showing up. The reality is, if you are refusing to seek, to strive after forgiveness, you are either in direct opposition to God's will for your life, or you don't understand the level to which you've been forgiven. And I need you to know tonight, I am not saying that to minimize the hurt that you have in your life. I'm not saying that to be the, the guy who looks and says, you know, just tough it up, suck it up, and get over it. That is not at all what I'm saying. 
I have no idea of the hurt that's going on in each and every person in this room. I am not saying it is easy. I am not saying that that stuff was justified in that being done to you. But what I am saying is, we've been called to forgive. And whether there's a mountain of hurt, a hill of hurt, or a world of hurt in front of us, we're called to start walking that road. I'd love to walk it with you. I'll be honest, I, I would love to walk it with you. It's gonna be hard, there's gonna be tears, there's gonna be difficult conversations, there's gonna be some tough prayer nights ahead of you, I guarantee it. That's part of reconciliation. And I think about the ways that the mountain of sin, the world of sin, the universe of sin that laid before Christ he sat in places like the garden, and he was so moved, he bled. But it was not easy. That wasn't a simple fix. But he walked that road for you and I, because he loved us. As we recognize the hurt that is before us, he will strengthen us. Why? Because he's been through it. He's been through the road of forgiveness. And where it starts is an attitude of forgiveness. This is the second facet that I want to talk about. How we begin to forgive. We're going to talk about a bunch of different ways or facets of forgiveness over the next couple of weeks but I wanted to really hone in tonight on this attitude of forgiveness, right? One of the incredible things that prayer does is it really writes our attitude. And so one, I can imagine one of the reasons why Jesus taught on forgiveness in the midst of that prayer is he knew that we did not naturally as people pursue forgiveness. We have long memories when it comes to hurt. And so he said, hey, you need to pray to get your mind ready to forgive because you're not naturally going to want to do it. And so you have to have this attitude of forgiveness. Turn me to Colossians 3.13. Very wonderful passage. It really pairs well with what we just came out of in Peter talking about holiness. And here, uh, Paul, he's writing to the church at Colossae, to the Colossians there. And he is talking about We've used this, if you've, if you've been around recovery for a while, we've used this analogy before because it's just rampant throughout the New Testament. But he's talking about this idea of clothes, right? And so he says, take off these clothes of the world, these things that you used to do, and burn them, and then put these new ones on. And I want to see uh, you to see the things that he focuses on here. Colossians 3, 13, or 3 12, and, and 13 says this. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. There's that word we were just highlighting a ton in the last month, holy. Talking about being sacred, being used for God's purpose in our world. So he says, all right, as people who are supposed to be used by God in your world, this is how you're supposed to live. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then he expands on that. 13, bearing with one another... If one has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And so he sets up this idea of forgiveness first by talking about an attitude, right? Compassion, compassionate hearts, kind hearts, humility, right? We talked about the pride that creeps in, the, actually having a humble heart, meekness, power under control. Patience, a desire not to just absolutely destroy someone when they do something wrong to you. Bearing with one another, and if they have a complaint against uh, you, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiving, forgiven you. As believers, we are called to have an attitude like this. 
to put on this attitude. If we're going to be used by God, if God's going to use us for a purpose here on earth, these are the things that need to be characteristics of our life. We talk about clothes. I really think about it as a jersey, right? Shows what team you're on. How should people know what team you're on? Well, your jersey should be a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I don't know about you, but there are plenty of days where I'm not wearing that jersey. So I got to put it on. Those nights when I don't get enough sleep, those days when I'm sitting in traffic, those times when that person at that family function has been bashing me on Facebook for who knows how long, got to put on that jersey. Because as God's chosen ones, right, as people holy and beloved people supposedly supposed to be used by God in our world, we must demonstrate that attitude as we seek to forgive. We wonder why we go to people seeking forgiveness or asking them to to apologize to us so that we can forgive them. We go in there with horrible attitudes of anger and frustration ready to light them up and we wonder why it won't go well or it never goes well. Our attitude is wrong. And so... I want to encourage you tonight. Encourage you to do a couple things. I could easily sit here and say, you know, hey, I want you to think about that person or that scenario or that situation where you need to go and seek forgiveness. But if you're anything like me, you already have been thinking about that for the past 35 minutes. The moment I said the word forgiveness. Right? It was raw You immediately thought of those things right away. I want to encourage you to start taking steps to seek to forgive. So what might that look like? Number one, I encourage you to do what Jesus taught us to do. Start praying about it. Pray that God would help you do that. Because I'll be honest, you're not going to be able to do it alone. Start praying that God would help you to forgive this person or these people. If you need help or you need someone to help you pray for that or just be beside you while you pray for that, there's going to be leaders down here right after I get done speaking who would love to pray with you for that. I'd also encourage you to start asking questions about how to go about forgiving someone. Maybe grab your table leader a couple minutes after everyone leaves your table group tonight and ask them some questions about what it, how they forgave the people in their lives. Because I guarantee they had some people they had to forgive. Or maybe ask them to go grab coffee with you or come an hour early next Tuesday before the meal or sit with them at the meal and have some time one-on-one and talk with them or Use River Connect to schedule a meeting with me and let's sit down and talk about some ways that you can start to forgive in the specific situation or surrounding a specific person in your life. Let's talk about it. Let's let's start to work through it. Maybe read some other places in Scripture that talk about forgiveness. There's this wonderful thing in the back of most Bibles where you can just look at the word forgiveness and it'll give you a list of all these passages about them. You know the things that you need to seek to forgive. They're ready. They've been sitting there like poison festering for a while. This week, let's start taking the steps to forgive. Why? Because we have been forgiven. Let's pray together. Lord, I am so thankful for the forgiveness that you gave me. Lord, as I sin, have sinned, and I continue to sin, Lord, I pray 
And I just thank you so much that your son, Christ Jesus, died so that I could have forgiveness from those sins. Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room that they would realize the depth of their sin and their need for a Savior, Lord. And I'm so thankful for the believers in this room who have already done that, Lord. And if there's someone in this room who have ne- who's never asked for that forgiveness, who's never realized the depth of their sin, and maybe it's starting to, they're starting to feel that now, Lord, I pray that you would push them to talk to someone, to have a conversation, or to right now pray and confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are Lord and you have risen from the dead. Lord, but as we do that, as we understand the depth of our sin, Lord, I pray that you would give us an attitude seeking forgiveness. Lord, that we would refuse to let those things, those hurts burden us. Let them to con- let them continue to separate us from brothers and sisters in Christ or separate us from others who we can share the gospel and good news to. Lord, and I don't know the hurt in this room, I, but I know that you do. Lord, and I know that you are ready to meet each person right where they're at. That you hurt with them over the sin and the atrocities that have been committed to them. Lord, but I know that you want to help them according to your strength. Seek forgiveness, Lord, and I pray that you would encourage each person tonight to begin to take steps towards forgiveness. We love you. In your precious and holy name, Jesus' name.